Uh, I appreciate uh, Richard for asking me to, to speak to you tonight. Uh, it, it's refreshing not to be doing a, a sermon uh, or lesson with the, the help of a, a translator or to people that, that don't speak my own language. Um, but uh, thank you for all your, your help and, and support. Really, thank you all for your help and support over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, tonight, this will, will not be a mission report, but I did want to, to let you know that uh, a lot of things were figured out on this trip to, to Romania. Um, a lot of uh, things were figured out, and we have a, a path going forward that will allow me to have a long-stay visa uh, to, to Romania. You know, so right now, we're just uh, trying to, to be patient and let bureaucracy do its thing, both the university bureaucracy and, and uh, two different governments' uh, bureaucracies. Um, but uh, uh, all your prayers are appreciated and will continue to be appreciated as we let uh, this process happen. And we should also pray that the Lord be with those who, who make decisions regarding my visa. From what I understand, Richard has been uh, discussing things in this class pertaining to, to missions. Now, with what I will talk about tonight, missions will be related, but it won't be the, the primary focus. Uh, I want us to view the scriptures we're about to read and, and study through uh, in a broader sense. Uh, there are many more applications that we can find through this text, but we will still recognize, we should still recognize that God's purpose in giving us this text is, though, is that we can be saved, so we can stay saved, and so we can show others the way to salvation. That, that is the primary purpose of God giving us this book, is to be saved, to stay saved, and show others the way to be saved. So I would invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. It's the very last page of the Bible. And this evening we will study through the first five verses of Revelation 22. Let us read Revelation chapter 22, 1 through 5 now. It says, And he showed me a pure river, of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no more night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, to better understand this text and its uh, implication for us today, I want us to realize the purpose of Revelation and to recognize the fact that it is indeed relevant to us today. Many try to avoid the book of Revelation because of its various in interpretations and its uh, difference in style from the rest of the New Testament. Many try to avoid this book, but the entire New Testament was given to us so that we can find the way to salvation, so that we can stay saved, and so we can show others the way. There is a purpose to this book. So this passage is for us. When one weeds through all the, the various interpretations of this book, one cannot escape the unavoidable fact that the book of Revelation has one primary purpose. Regardless of whether you hold the historicist, the idealist, the the preterists, and numerous other views and interpretations of Revelation, one still comes to the conclusion that the purpose of this book is so that all can be encouraged to remain faithful 
because ultimately Christ brings victory to those who are loyal to him. That is the purpose of this book. Christ brings victory to those who are loyal to him. And we must understand the fact that this is written for the church, the churches that existed at that time, as well as the church that exists today. We see in the first three chapters, in chapters two and three, that, uh, that there are seven churches that are receiving letters from Jesus Christ. And there is a promise to those in Revelations chapter 2 and Revelations chapter 3. There is a promise for those who remain faithful. So as we study tonight, I want you to keep this in your mind. Do not be distracted by the various interpretations. But recognize that this is for you. This is to encourage you to remain faithful and to overcome the things of this world. In chapters 4 through chapters 20, we see various vivid imagery and visions and symbolism and scenes that are shown to depict the evil of this world. And in the end, we see that all the evil that exists along with Satan are ultimately crushed, and those who are made righteous by the blood of the Lamb are placed into a glorious land. The Lamb overcomes and Christ brings victory for all of his people. In chapter 21, we read of this new place. We read of the new Jerusalem and the glory of God that is contained within it. And in chapter 22, where we, where we will be tonight, we see the continuation of this scene, and we see another charge for Christians to remain faithful to God. So that sets the scene for us, but the primary focus for us this evening are verses 1 through 5. And there are two primary divisions for this lesson, and in the first part of this lesson we will discuss now, we are going to consider the river. Let's look at Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1 again. It reads, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Can you imagine this scene? It sets a very vivid scene for us. In Revelations chapter 21, verse 9, one of the angels of God, uh, who we had seen in a previous scene that John had mentioned, is showing him the new Jerusalem. And after seeing this new Jerusalem, this angel accompanies John to a river. And there are three attributes of this river that are shown and that we will discuss. Before we discuss these attributes, there is a passage I would like for you to mark. We will not turn there this evening or right now, but I would like for you to mark it down or to, uh, to write it down or, or put a bookmark there or something because you might be turning to this scripture later. But mark Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47 is a cross-reference to another river. And as we study through this lesson this evening, uh, I, I want you to note the similarities between the scene that is set in Ezekiel 47 and the scene that is set here in Revelation chapter 22. So the first attribute of the river that we see here in Revelation chapter 22 is that it is a pure and crystal clear river. Have you ever come across a pure, crystal clear river? A river without any contamination, no dirtiness, no bacteria, nothing that makes this water unclean. Pure water. I heard that in Iceland, most of the river water there is so clean that there is no need for filtration or purification to, to make the water safe for consumption. Now, that, that might be true, but that is not pure water. There is dirt, there is bacteria, but we must recognize that there is a symbol of purity that is established by water. We can consider the prophecy found in Ezekiel 
36, verse 25, in which Ezekiel uh, quotes God by saying, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And we can also consider Numbers 19, in which we see that water was used to purify the Hebrew people. Water purifies in the sense that it washes away. But this river that John shows here is a pure river. There's a pure aspect to this water. And what it shows for us is that in eternity, heaven should not house the unclean, but it will be for the clean. We see this in the conclusion of Revelation in the conclusion of Revelation 21, when it is said that nothing that defiles or causes an abomination will enter into the city. This city will be one of complete purity. The river is pure, and those who drink the water are continuously made pure. And those who walk by it see clearly what lies beneath it, the love, the grace, and the mercy that is found in Jesus Christ. The second thing that we see is that this river is filled with the water of life. This is living water. This water, after all, is, as we will note later, proceeds from the throne of God and from the Lamb. Therefore, it is as Jesus spoke in John chapter 4, verse 14, in which he says, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give to them will never thirst, but the water I shall give them will become in them a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Water of this world preserves life for only a short time, but the water that exists here in this scene is living water. It's water of life. The one or the ones who drink this water will live forever and ever. The third thing that we see is that the river source is of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Throughout the book of Revelation, we come to understand that the Lamb is representative of the humble sacrifice of Christ and his new glorified position. And the throne of God is representative of God's authority and power. It is from these things that the the throne of God, or is from these things that the, the river flows. There is a hymn that I recently learned called Sacred Throne. Uh, My dad and I have discovered numerous amounts of new hymns uh, on YouTube, and this was a hymn that I come across not too long ago. And the lyrics of this song made me think of this passage. And perhaps the writer of this song was inspired by Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. Beneath the sacred throne of God, I saw a river rise. The streams where peace and pardoning blood descended from the skies. I stood amazed and wondered when or why this ocean rose that wafts salvation down to man, his traitors, and his foes. That sacred flood from Jesus' veins was free to make a way, and Mary's or Manasseh's stains or sins more vile than they. It is significant and should not be overlooked that this river has these things as its source, the throne of God and the Lamb. In Ezekiel 47, the, the prophet Ezekiel sees a river that flows from the temple. But in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22 we, we come to understand that there is no temple in this new Jerusalem. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Therefore, the river of life brings to us life and salvation directly 
from the source, from God the Father himself and from the Lamb. There is no need for temple worship or or the mediation of man because the river comes from God and it comes from the Lamb. These three attributes of the river should be of encouragement to us just as it was of encouragement to the people of John's day. It reminds us that there is something out there, unstained and without contamination. And it reminds us that despite the hopelessness in the world, that there is life and there is hope found in Jesus Christ. And as long as we may remain with him, we will always have that life. Now that we have talked about the river, I would like for us to shift focus to the tree. Let us reread verse 2. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The river of life is in the city, and so is the tree of life. Now, I do not think it is a coincidence that the tree of life appears in the first book, of the Bible, and it appears here in the very last chapter of the Bible. The Bible was written by over 40 individuals over a period of 1,500 years, and it covers a a period of time of over 5,000 years. Yet Moses, the first author, and John, the final author, included a reference to the tree of life. The Bible is a beautiful book with a unity that points to God as its divine inspiration and ultimate author. But about this tree of life, what does it represent? Why is it mentioned in this passage? A tree of life represents man's communion with God and his protection of us from sin and death. For in the, in the Garden of Eden, there was another tree, the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil, the only tree that they were forbidden to eat from in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. And if they avoided that tree and instead ate from the tree of life and from the others in the garden, they would have peace with God and with each other in the garden. And they would know no sin or death. In Revelation chapter 22, we see two primary attributes of this tree. And again, I want you to remember Ezekiel 47, because in Ezekiel 47, we see a reference to many trees that are on the other, uh, that are on either side of the river. And these we will consider shortly. The first attribute of this tree is that it yields Twelve fruits. It yields twelve fruits. Now, as one reads Revelation, it is important to note the the symbolic significance of the numbers that are mentioned throughout the book. Throughout Revelation, you constantly see the numbers 7, 10, 12, 100, and 1,000. And you also see the multiples of those numbers. Now, Jewish and early Christian writers often used numerology to make points or to, or, or, or to add an extra layer to what they were writing. The number 12 represented the fullness of God's people. There were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 apostles of Jesus. In Jewish calendars, there are 12 months though in leap years there are 13 months. Twelve is significant because it represents fullness and completeness, much in the same way that seven and ten do. But twelve represents that for God's people. So this tree yielded twelve fruits, 
And then it says that each tree yields its fruit every month. Now, I have to admit, as I was reading and uh, studying this passage, I had gotten a little confused. So are we talking about one tree, or are we talking about many trees? In this scene, do we have one tree of life, or do we have many trees of life? Each tree yields its food each month. Now, I, consult, uh, I consulted uh, some commentaries on this, and this is what uh, Barnes Notes on the Bible has to say about this. I think it's worth mentioning. It was there, the tree of life, not a single tree, but it abounded everywhere on the banks of the river and in all the streets. It was the common tree in this blessed paradise of which all might partake and which was everywhere the emblem of immortality. Now, I, I happen to agree with this interpretation that the tree of life was the common tree in the city. Everywhere you went in that place, there was a tree that would yield fruits, that would sustain life for every soul there. Twelve fruits on each tree. Twelve, fruit, twelve fruits on each tree every month. There was no season for harvest. The season was always. You always could partake of the fruit of this tree. Every soul is fed with sustenance that gives immortality. And we compare this with what is written in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 12. Along the bank of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Now we know that Ezekiel 47 is, is not the same scene. We know that because the, the scene that is set there, the water flows from the temple. And in Revelation 22, there is no temple. But we should come to understand the life-giving quality of this fruit. We know that one will thirst again if he continues to drink the water of this world. Is it not the same with the food of this world? Is it not the same with the, the food of this world that it, it will sustain you for a short time, but you're going to be hungry again? But in heaven... In this new Jerusalem, God provides our sustenance. And even now, he should provide us with the sustenance to go through this life saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, the second attribute of this tree that we come to see is that its leaves are for the healing of the nations. The one piece of our lesson tonight that ties with missions is this one. The leaves heal the nations. God had always intended for his kingdom to be made up of many nations. Prior to the establishment of kingdoms and nations, God had made man in his image, Genesis 1, 26. And this is what he says to man in verse 28, the first commandment given in all of Scripture. Then God blessed them, and then God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God intended for man to multiply and fill the world. And man did exactly that. From Adam and Eve descended every single human on this planet. Now it should be noted that we continue in the pattern of Adam and Eve and that we have all sinned and we have all partaken of the same fruit that they have partaken of. But from Adam and Eve descended every human and every nation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22, 
It is written, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made, in the, all shall be made alive. So all men, regardless of nation, background, intellectual ability, have descended from Adam. But we have all followed that same pattern of sin that Adam had followed, and then all of us are in need of healing. All of us are in need of healing and resurrection. So it is in Christ that all men can be made alive and healed. But in Revelation chapter 22, it is said of this tree that the leaves are for the healing of the nations. We compare this to Ezekiel 47 and verse 12, in which the leaves of those trees are used for medicine. The tree of life provides medicine for all the nations. And I believe that this healing and this medicine for the nations is the peace that can be found in the atonement and in the sacrifice of Christ. And it is the unity that we all enjoy through him. It is written in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift sword up against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In that day when we are all gathered into heaven, we may be surprised to see brothers from Iran, from North Korea, from Russia, and we will not go to war with them there. They will not be our enemies there. But instead, we will rejoice. We will have joy because we have the same healing that they have. And we have the same unity that is found in the blood of Jesus Christ. And this brings me to the final part of my lesson for this evening. We now consider the primary implication of the river and the tree. And as we consider this implication, I want us to think about our Christian walk right now. And I want us to think about how we can improve on and correct things in our lives. Let us reread verses 3 through 5 of Revelation 22. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no light there, or there shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and, he, and they shall reign forever and ever. For those who get to partake of the new Jerusalem, for those who get to dwell there, and for those of us who get to see this river and tree of life, this passage is for them. And hopefully it is for us if we are living and walking as we should be living and walking. It says, His name shall be on their foreheads. In this life, we have one of two things written on our foreheads. You either have the mark of the beast because you have chosen to make something, you have chosen to make something else your God. You have chosen something else to devote your life to. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17 speaks of this mark. Or you have the mark of God the Father's name written on your forehead. And this is covered here as well as in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. If God's name is written on your foreheads, obviously not in a, a literal sense, but in the sense that you have been living as God would call you to live, then these things are for you. There will be no more curse. There will be no curse there. You will be in the same place and realm where God is. You will need no lamp or light of the sun. We know that in Genesis chapter 1, God made the light and the sun for us. But in this place, there will be no need for it. 
because God himself, God's glory, will be our light. And the best part of it all, you will get to be there with God. You will get to be there with God and with the Lamb. It is as if Adam and Eve had not fallen from grace. You are in the garden. You are in the city with God. So you see, it is important for us to remember the river and the tree. It reminds us of the place we want to be. There will be no sadness, sickness, or wickedness there, for we will have the protection of God and be in his care. As you go throughout this week, I challenge you to think about heaven. I challenge you to think about the river of life and the tree of life. Think about its attributes and let it give you something to look forward to. We all need something to look forward to. We all have the upward call and goal to strive for. And let us remember that the river and the tree are here, or are there, rather, for us to behold with our fellow saints. And that God is waiting for us there so that we can be with him. Let us close class tonight with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather here tonight. We're so thankful for the, uh, the time of worship that we were able to have. We thank you for Jeffrey's lessons this morning and, and this evening. And Father, help us to uh, continuously try to understand your word better and to seek to serve you with the talents that you have given to us. Father, we're so thankful for the place that is not yet prepared, but you're preparing it for us. And we know it will be glorious and that we will rejoice and, and be glad when we are there. Help us to constantly think about that place. Help us to change our lives Help us to understand that this life is, is so short, Father, and we're not going to be able to take the things of this world with us. But help us to see the bigger picture, that we will get to be with you for eternity, and that is what your ultimate will is. And Father, help us to see and examine our own behavior Father, we know that there are things in our life that, uh, that make us stumble and fall. Help us to correct the things in our lives that we need to correct and repent of our sins. And help us to look to your Son, who is the model and an example of how to walk by faith and not by sight. Help us to look to him every day that we live. Father, we pray for the sick and those who are uh, in need of the gospel. I ask that you bless the feet of those who want to share the good news, help the right doors to open for the gospel to go into new places. And we ask that your healing hand be upon the sick that uh, were unable to be here this evening. Father, thank you for all the blessings that we have, both physically and spiritually, but thank you most of all for the hope of everlasting life that we have because of your Son and the forgiveness of sins we enjoy through him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.